Good evening and welcome to IPA 50 webinar series New Horizons in Physics. Today we have 25th lecture of the series. As you know, we started in September and we have had talks by many, many eminent scientists. Today we bring you yet another interesting talk by Professor Shobhana Narsevan from JNCSR uh, Bangalore. To introduce the speaker and conduct today's lecture, we have a young physicist, Dr. Bulumoni Kalita. She did a PhD from Tejpur Central University, Assam and is presently working as assistant professor in Dibrugad University. Her area of research interest is computational material science, in particular working on DFT modeling of nanomaterials. She was a postdoctoral fellow with Professor Shobhana Narsimhan and she will tell us about uh, Professor Shobhana and her work. Over to you, Bulimoni. Thank you, Madam. Uh, a very good evening to all. First of all, I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me this opportunity to introduce the speaker of today's lecture. Uh, am I audible? Can you tell me a little loud? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So all of us know that the lecture will be delivered by Professor Shobhana Narasimhan. Uh, professor Narasimhan is a professor of theoretical sciences at the Zawaharlal Nehru Center for Advanced Scientific Research in Bangalore. Her main area of research interest is computational nanoscience. Uh, Professor Narasimhan earned her B.Sc. in Physics from St. Xavier's College, Mumbai, M.Sc. in Physics from IIT, Bombay. She received her Ph.D. in Theoretical Physics from Harvard University in 1991. Subsequently, she did her postdoctoral work at Brookhaven National Laboratory, USA, and at Fritz Haber Institute of the Max Planck Society in Berlin, Germany. She joined the Theoretical Sciences Unit of JNCSR as a faculty member in 1996. She was formerly the chair of the theoretical sciences unit and the dean of academic affairs at JNCSR, a fellow of the National Academy of Sciences India 2011, and a recipient of the Sri Sakti Samman Science Award 2010 and the Kalpana Chawla Women's Scientist Award of the Government of Karnataka in 2010. Professor Narasimhan has been elected as the international honorary member of American Academy of Arts and Sciences. Uh, that recognizes the distinguished work of scholars and leaders in the field of art, science, humanity, and public life. Professor Shobhana Narasimhan has actively involved in the development programs that encourage women to be a part of the sciences. She has supported the promotion of women in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics in India and abroad. She also became the member of two committees set up by the government of India, the National Task Force on Women in Science and the Standing Committee on Women in Science. Apart from this very brief introduction, I would also like to add here that Professor Shobhana Narasimhan is a very good teacher with excellent presentation skills. So I am sure that the participants will definitely enjoy her lecture today. So without delay, I would like to invite Professor Shobhana Narasimhan to deliver her talk on designing novel materials one atom at a time. Madam Shobhana. Uh, thank you, Bulumoni uh, and uh, Vandana for that introduction. And uh, I would like to thank the Indian Physics Association for asking me to give this talk. It's a great honor and also a pleasure for me. Uh, I trust that you can see my screen and also uh, hear me. Is that okay? You can hear me and you can see me? Yes. Huh? Okay. Yes. So today I'm going to talk about designing novel nanomaterials one at a time. Since I was told that the audience would be a general audience of physicists, I have uh, made at least half my talk uh, of uh, rather introductory materials. So if uh, uh, some of you get a little bit insulted by the uh, rather introductory nature of the material, I apologize in advance. Uh, so just a second, this is not okay. So I will, uh, I've divided my talk into four parts. So first I will tell you a little bit about why I'm interested in designing materials. So I am a material girl. So materials, of course, define human history and progress. So much so we consider materials such an important indicator of human history that as you all know, we uh, 
define uh, human development by the materials that were used and developed in that time. So that's why we talk about the Stone Age and the Copper Age and the Bronze Age and the Iron Age, etc. And my students made me put in this little smiling face here because they said otherwise people won't notice the joke about the Iron Age. So how many materials exist in nature? This is of course the periodic table, which I'm sure you're all familiar with. And there are 98 naturally occurring elements. So of course we have made, we have synthesized other elements which are unstable and don't occur naturally in nature. And of the minerals, that is the compounds that we find naturally in nature, there are about 4,000 of them. However, we are not restricted to just these 4,000. We can make new materials. So this is, of course, again, the periodic table, but made out of Lego blocks to sort of indicate that we can treat the elements of the periodic table as building blocks, as Lego blocks for us to play around with, and we can use them to make new materials. And people have made so many new materials that they, you might have seen in the days when those of us still went to libraries. Uh, there used to be these books called the Landolf Bernstein series, which uh, listed the phase diagrams and the properties of all the uh, materials, uh, alloys, etc., which existed in nature and also which had been synthesized. And these would just take shelves and shelves of any library. Now, how many can one potentially make? So it had, so people have made estimates of this. So if you consider the 9,000 uh, possible sort of crystal structure prototypes and only stoichiometric, sorry, there's a spelling mistake there, stoichiometric compositions, then it's estimated that if you have quaternary compounds, that is with four elements in them, then there are about three into 10 raised to 11 that you can make. And if you have five elements, five constituents, then it goes up to 10 raised to 13. So this is obviously a huge phase space, a huge chemical phase space in which one can play around to try to make materials designed for specific applications. So I find this whole thing rather fascinating and I'm particularly fascinated by bronze because the Bronze Age, as you know, is a, a prehistoric age. Bronze is an alloy of copper and tin, which is harder than copper alone, and it does not rust unlike iron. And here are some pictures of Bronze Age weapons from India. Also, there's the famous dancing girl of Mohenjo-Daro. Uh, we had to study about this statuette in school. It's there in the museum in Mumbai. And it's a very famous statuette that is was made in the Indus Valley civilization and it's made out of bronze. So what fascinates me is how did they know that they could make bronze? How did they think of making this alloy of copper and tin which would have superior properties? So if you think about all of material discoveries until very recent times, they were all either accidental discoveries or they were developed by trial and error. Uh, these are just two cartoons on this slide, uh, which show uh, uh, cartoons not of um, discoveries of um, materials, but in this case, it is uh, another famous ancient discovery, which is the discovery of the wheel. The one on the left shows uh, a sort of uh, humorous depiction of how the wheel might have been accidentally discovered. And the one on the right shows uh, how it might have been discovered by trial and error. So these are really the two ways in which materials have been developed. And it is quite fascinating to think that this rich plethora of materials that we have were developed in these ways. 
So a very famous example is the iron catalyst that is used for the harbor process. The harbor process is what we use to synthesize uh, ammonia from nitrogen and hydrogen, as you may remember from chemistry classes. And many people think that it was the most important scientific discovery of the 20th century because it allowed us to enormously uh, increase food production by using chemical fertilizers. And it is estimated that the world population would be uh, at least, uh, I mean, at most half of what it is now if it weren't for this discovery. So how did they decide to use the iron catalyst? Uh, it was chosen after about 2,500 materials were tested. So this was really the trial and error method uh, in the uh, um, in, in Germany, in the factory where they were looking for it. They really tried lots and lots of different materials and so did Harbour try lots of materials. And in fact, it's interesting that it was not iron, but osmium that was the best choice that he found. But at that time, the world supply of osmium was very, very small. And so that was why iron was chosen. Now, this process, this kind of brute force process or combinatorial process is, of course, still used a lot in industry. But one would like to do something better than that. So one tries. Uh, to replace this trial and error method by what's called rational materials design, which is what I will talk about in this uh, talk today. And this requires a to and fro between theory and experiment. So what does a computational scientist like me do, do? We take a bunch of materials, say material A, material B, material C. We do computations on them. Then we analyze our results. From this analysis, we get some insight into design principles. And with this insight, uh, we can then design a new material with desired properties. Uh, I just want to interrupt for a moment to ask, can you hear me clearly? Uh, should I put off the fan? Because it seems to me there's some disturbance. No, we are hearing OK. OK, fine. Okay, so why do we do computations at all? So as you know, doing experiments is rather expensive. And nowadays, uh, doing a com computation is often much quicker and much cheaper. Uh, computers have become so fast and so small that you can do quite sophisticated calculations even just using a laptop. Of course, most of the calculations that I'm going to talk about were done using uh, high performance computing resources, but you'd be surprised what you can do with even just a laptop. Uh, I highlighted that one can work from home because uh, over the last year when we have been facing this coronavirus situation, of course, this turned out to be a huge advantage that my group could work from home. We were not uh, facing huge obstacles. Uh, uh, of course, uh, doing computations can lead to greater understanding. One can simulate conditions that can be very difficult to achieve in a lab, for example, very high pressures. You can switch off effects in a calculation. For example, if you want to switch off relativistic effects or switch off magnetism, you can do this in a calculation which you really can't do in an experiment. I will show you an example. And we can make predictions for experimentalists to verify. So here is an example of, uh, uh, you know, if you want to see what is the uh, what phase is the iron in at the Earth's center? Or what is the uh, material phase at the center of Jupiter or something? You really can't do an experiment. You can't go there and you can't get achieve such high pressures easily in the lab. But on the computer, it's relatively easy. So this is one of the advantages of doing computations. So now I'm going to talk to you about the kind of computations I do, which are what are called density functional theory. Uh, it's becoming quite popular, but since not everybody knows about it, I will tell you a little bit about what density functional theory is. So if we want to study a material, 
uh, then the basic problem we have to solve as in much of physics is that we have a number of nuclei with certain atomic numbers at certain positions and we have some number of electrons and these interact of course via the Coulomb interaction. So systems like this are atoms, molecules and condensed matter systems. And to solve this, we want to solve the many electron Schrodinger equation. Uh, in special cases, uh, you may want to solve the Dirac equation instead, but let's just consider the Schrodinger equation for now. And of course, the solutions must be properly antisymmetrized to so satisfy the Pauli exclusion principle. So we can write down this equation easily enough, but unfortunately, we don't know how to solve this because it's a many body equation. So what do material scientists do? What do solid state physicists do? They all want to solve this many particle Schrodinger equation and there are two broad approaches people take. People might take the many body theory approach where they retain the many body nature and they use a model Hamiltonian like the Ising model or the Hubbard model or something with some suitable parameterization. And then depending on the model they have, they may be able to solve it numerically or anal analytically. Instead, people like me use density functional theory where you map this many particle equation onto a system of one particle equations. This mapping is exact in principle, but approximate in pr practice. You don't have any free parameters and you have to solve it numerically. So the many body Hamiltonian uh, the terms in it are, of course, you have the kinetic energy of the nuclei, the kinetic energy of the electrons, the Coulomb interaction between nuclei, between nuclei and electrons, and between the electrons. And let's assume we make the von Oppenheimer approximation, so we separate out an electronic Hamiltonian. So you have these electronic Hamiltonian terms, and it is this electron-electron interaction term which makes it hard to solve this. So density functional theory is a very clever way of treating these troublesome electron-electron interactions. So instead of telling you the theorems that it's based on, I will tell you uh, in a sort of cartoon manner what you do. You map the many electron problem onto an equivalent uh, one electron problem. So I'm showing you with this cartoon you have a bunch of people of two genders. Uh, let us assume that the men are like nuclei and the women are like electrons. I say that's because the women are always going places. They can, um, yeah, uh, what shall we say, flexible. Uh, and they have complicated interactions between them. And the problem you're solving is trying to arrange all of these people in an arrangement such that you achieve globally optimal happiness. This is obviously a very hard problem to solve. And what you do in DFT is that you can map it onto an equivalent problem where you have a number of these men and you have just one woman whom you have to move so that she is happiest. This is obviously a much easier problem to solve. Now, you obviously have to pay some price and the price you pay is that the men look a little bit different. You, and that I've shown schematically uh, in these days, it seemed uh, sort of most uh, appropriate to show this difference by putting face masks on them so that they look a little bit different. And these face masks, represents schematically what is known as the exchange correlation interaction. I'll talk about that in a minute. The person who came up with all these ideas was Walter Kohn, who has a very interesting personal history. He was sent out of Austria as a young boy to escape the Nazis. Uh, his parents were uh, killed in the Holocaust. And then he was, however, then put in a prison camp first in England and then in Canada because he was considered to be an enemy alien. And it was in these prison camps that he first got interested in mathematics and physics. And uh, he went on to develop density functional theory for which he won the Nobel Prize. It has become such an influential field 
that if you look at the FISREV journals uh, and you look at the 10 most cited papers in the FISREV journals, uh, then all, which I have listed here, I looked at their citations this morning, the 10 most cited papers are all related to some aspect or another of DFT. Uh, Walter Cohn's uh, two landmark papers which started the field are here. They're, at the, uh, they're not at the top position, but that's just because they are so famous and such standard papers that nobody bothers to cite them anymore. In fact, I think the top 16 papers are all about some aspect of DFT or another. Now, I told you that uh, there is this face mask, which represents the exchange correlation potential that we have to introduce in the Hamiltonian. When we do this mapping from the many electron equation to the one electron equation, uh, the, there is a problem here. Uh, this fact that we can do this mapping seems too good to be true. And in a sense it is because though we know that such a potential exists, we don't know what it is. And right now we don't know the, till today we do not know the exact form of this exchange correlation potential, but we have some very, very good guesses for it, which is why DFT works. But if you could design a perfect mask, then I mean, I'm sure a Nobel Prize is waiting for you. So this just shows schematically why DFT calculations are also called first principles calculations. It's because uh, they have no empirical input. The only input into your calculation is atomic numbers and atomic masses. And then you crank out the machinery of DFT and then you get your output. I will talk in a second about what this output is. So how we use DFT is you input a structure and a composition. You can also uh, calculate the structure if you don't know it, though that is a rather hard problem. Then you do DFT computations. Depending on your system, the DFT calculations may be very fast. Like if you're doing bulk silicon, even on a laptop, it will take you maybe two seconds or something. But the kind of systems I will show you later in the talk, that takes you know maybe a week or two weeks or something on a big, a huge cluster. And the output is mostly very accurate results for the total energy and the properties of the system. So what do we get from this DFT calculation? By solving this system of one electron equations, which are called the Cohn-Sham equations, we get the total energy of the system. This is something which we know we get in principle exactly. That is what we get for the one electron system is the same as the total energy for the many, many electron system. And this total energy we can use to do, calculate many, many things. For example, the geometric structure, we can also get the charge density, which is again a quantity that is in principle calculated exactly correctly. We also get electronic eigenvalues. For these two, I put a happy face. For this, I put a sort of puzzle face because the electronic eigenvalues do not in principle have any such physical interpretation. They are not guaranteed to be correct, though we do use them all the time also. So this is just to say that DFT codes can today run on many platforms. And this is uh, my friend Nicola Marzari got uh, this code that we all use called Quantum Espresso to run on his mobile phone. Uh, this was a few years ago. So you see that his mobile phone doesn't look as sleek uh, as uh, our phones do today. Uh, this I think was already maybe 10 years ago or something. So the last bit I wanted to say in my introduction is why do we talk about nano today? And I'm sure all of you have heard a lot about nanoscience. You can't get away from nano at all. Uh, of course, I put the Tata Nano car just as a joke, but then I also wanted to show you this is what the kind of nano car that 
someone like me is interested in really looks like. In fact, there's a competition to uh, design truly nano cars. And this was one of the entries for those nano cars. Uh, I am beginning to work a little bit on uh, nano rotors, motors, etc. But though I won't talk about that work today. So why all the fuss about nanomaterials? What are the advantages of going nano? Of course, the first advantage is that you can have miniaturization. And that is the thing that most people are immediately aware of. But scientifically, in addition to miniaturization, we are also interested in other things. So of course, from an economic point of view, nanoscience is uh, very interesting because you would need, in principle, less amount of possibly costly materials. For example, in our cars, we all have catalytic converters, which convert uh, poisonous exhaust. For example, carbon monoxide gets converted to carbon dioxide. And the catalysts that do this are metals like palladium, rhodium, platinum, which are all extremely expensive. In fact, they're more expensive than gold. And if you can use nano-sized particles of this, then obviously it is much, much cheaper. But it's not just that they're smaller and cheaper, they're also better. By making it smaller, you make it a better catalyst. So by reducing the size, you obtain enhanced properties. So for example, for catalysts, they often are better catalysts if you reduce the size. Also for magnets, sometimes you become um, you get higher magnetic moments. You might have uh, metals that are not ferromagnetic in their bulk, but they become ferromagnetic when you have nanoparticles of them. Similarly, gold, which is something which we normally think of as being extremely inert uh, in the bulk becomes reactive when you have gold nanoparticles. So these are some of the reasons why nanoscience is fascinating. Uh, if you are a physicist or chemist. Now, in my title, I said one atom at a time. So why did I put that one at a, at a time? So this is because at the nanoscale, we find that adding or removing just one atom to your system can make a huge difference. So this is work uh, I've shown you here as an example. This is the reactivity, the catalytic performance of gold nanoparticles, very, very small gold nanoparticles. So this is the number of gold atoms in the particles, so one, two, three, four, et cetera. And it looks at how good they are at converting carbon monoxide to carbon dioxide. And what you see is you see these pronounced oscillations. So you see that eight atoms in your nanoparticle makes it a fairly good catalyst. But if you had seven atoms, so you just remove one atom, it's not a good catalyst at all. And if you add one atom, so you go to nine atoms, again, it's not such a good catalyst. This is not work in my group, this is by another group. So it's very fascinating that adding or subtracting one atom makes such a change. Similarly, uh, in two dimensional materials. So for example, there is this uh, material, you, you have probably all heard about graphene, which is one uh, monolayer of carbon atoms. Uh, similarly, another very popular material these days is phosphorine, which is a monolayer of phosphorus atoms. Now, if you take phosphorine and you look at the number of layers you have in your system, so if you have one layer of phosphorine, which would just be this, and then you add another layer and another layer and another layer, you see the electronic band gap decreases sharply. Now the band gap is of course something you are very interested in for things like uh, semiconductor devices, et cetera. So again, adding or subtracting one monolayer of atoms makes a big difference. So now in the uh, remaining uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm going to tell you about four examples from work done in my group over the uh, last decade or so uh, on designing novel nanomaterials. 
we do a lot of different work. This work is sort of at the interface of physics and chemistry and material science, I would say. Uh, I'm a little bit amused by this because I personally uh, stopped studying chemistry after the 12th standard. And the reason I did that was that I was, though I was good at chemistry as a theoretical subject, I was uh, terrible at chemistry lab. I was uh, hopeless at identifying compounds when you were given that in chemistry practicals, etc. So I never thought I would end up working in chemistry. So the first example that I'm going to talk to you about is about gold nanoparticles, okay? So if you have uh, larger gold nanoparticles. So for example, in this picture, I've shown you by larger, I mean here in this case, it's a gold nanoparticle, which has composed of 20 gold atoms. Okay, these tend to have 3D clumped up shapes. This is true both in the gas phase and when these nanoparticles are deposited on oxide substrates, when they're used as catalysts, they're usually deposited on a substrate, which is typically an oxide, okay? However, there's reason to believe that they will be better nanocatalysts if you can instead make them into a flat planar shape, okay? So how can you make this transition in shape happen? How can you tune the morphology of these catalysts? So our main goal here is to flatten the curve. Okay, sorry, this was again a stupid joke uh, inspired by coronavirus times. Our goal here is to flatten the nanoparticle. So what am I saying? Just telling you again, it's like if I have a system, my model system is the 20 atom gold nanoparticle on a magnesium oxide substrate. Okay, so if I look at the energy, this three-dimensional shape is lower in energy than this flat planar shape. But I think that this would be a better nanocatalyst. So can I somehow flip the balance so that this would become lower in energy than this? Okay, this is a problem a lot of groups have worked on and I've listed some of them over here. So previous authors have suggested various strategies and again, a silly uh, lockdown inspired joke that I'm saying is that uh, this is just somebody saying that you can get flattened if you work for long enough from home uh, in lockdown times, you uh, ultimately get flattened down. Uh, so the suggestion that we made uh, with my collaborator, Stefano de Gironcoli and my PhD student, Nisha Maman, was we said, if you dope the magnesium oxide support with an electron donor. So for example, you replace the divalent magnesium atoms, a few of them with trivalent aluminum atoms. Okay, then what happens is we predicted using DFT that you would get this planar shape being favored. And uh, this is Nisha, the student who did the calculations. And if you look carefully, you can see that the earrings that she's wearing, this earring is the planar known gold nanoparticle. And this uh, earring is the three-dimensional gold nanoparticle. This was her birthday present from the group. So we made this theoretical prediction. And after we did the work, uh, very soon after, within a few months, the group of Freund in Berlin uh, did the experiment. So uh, they used a slightly uh, different um, system from ours, but the principle was exactly the same. So they took uh, uh, gold nanoparticles and they deposited it. Instead of magnesium oxide, they used calcium oxide. And instead of aluminum as a dopant, they used molybdenum as a dopant. And these are scanning tunneling microscope images. So you see when you don't dope the support, you get these three-dimensional shaped nanoparticles. And when you dope the support, they become flat, okay? They become pancake-like, they become like chapatis. And these nanoparticles, incidentally, are much larger than the 20 atom gold nanoparticles we work with in our calculations. So this shows this is not 
uh, crucially dependent on the size in this case. It seems to work even for larger size nanoparticles. So by doping the support, our idea works and you can tune the morphology, okay? So why does the morphology change? We showed in our DFT calculation, this is the kind of the access, the access to the kind of information you have when you are doing a density functional theory calculation. So this is a side view of the system. This is the planar goal system. This is the magnesium oxide support. This pink atom over here is the aluminum donor. And what we have plotted here is the change in electronic charge density, that is the charge uh, transfer. And a red lobe means that electrons are gained, and a blue lobe means that electrons are lost. So electrons are lost from the support, and electrons are gained by the gold nanoparticle. And the gold nanoparticle now becomes negatively charged, okay? So it becomes a highly negatively charged nanoparticle. And then it becomes favorable for this negatively charged gold nanoparticle to flatten down, okay? And to wet the substrate, okay? Now, this negatively charged nanoparticle, because of its negative charge, it now becomes a better catalyst for some reactions. Now, again, this is a very interesting thing because for some reactions, you want the cat particle to be negatively charged. For some reactions, you want it to be positively charged. So we've also been playing a lot with that. So depending on what kind of dopant you use, whether it's an electron donor or an electron acceptor, you can make it positively charged, you can make it negatively charged and different dopants work to different extents. So we've been working a lot on all that. So then you can also look at the catalytic activity. So you can compute reaction barriers using density functional theory. So this shows, for example, on this gold nanoparticle, we're looking at the barrier for oxygen dissociation. So these two blue atoms are oxygen atom, it's an oxygen molecule, which is absorbed on this gold nanoparticle just at its edge. And you can see it is slowly getting dissociated. That is the distance between the two oxygens is increasing. And what we have calculated using density functional theory here is the energy of the whole system. So the height from here to here in energy is the barrier, the energy barrier that you have to climb, the energy you have to supply to break this bond within the oxygen molecule. And you can compute what it is on the three-dimensional cluster in the uh, undoped system and in the two-dimensional cluster in the doped system. And when we do that, we see that here the barrier was 0.6 ATV. Here the barrier has lowered considerably to 0.29 EV. So you have considerably lowered the barrier, which means you facilitated the facilitated the reaction, which means you made it a better catalyst, okay? And if you just look at Boltzmann factors, this means at room temperature, the reaction rate would go up by five orders of magnitude. Okay, now I come to our next uh, example where we are asking whether we can make a two-dimensional surface alloy out of bulk emissible metals. So this harks back right to, to what I talked about at the beginning. I talked about how bronze was an alloy of copper and tin. So of course you can make alloys out of many, many different combinations of metals, but it turns out you cannot make alloys out of all combinations, okay? So there's something called the Hume-Rothery rules, which uh, tell you when you can make uh, alloys. If you try to make alloys out of certain combinations of metals, it will not mix, it will not form an alloy, it will just phase segregate. So one such bulk emissible pair is iron and gold. You cannot make an alloy out of iron and gold in, in the bulk that is in three dimensions. So we were studying this problem and we showed that if you take iron and gold in two dimensions, and if you deposit a single monolayer of iron and gold, 
on a ruthenium support, on a ruthenium substrate, then we showed that in a certain ratio of iron is to gold, in a one is to two ratio, you would form a surface alloy with this kind of structure, okay? Here, the red atoms are iron and the yellow gold colored atoms are gold. So we said this would be a stable alloy, that is it would not phase segregate into iron and gold. So uh, we first predicted that this would be a pair that would form a stable surface alloy out of bulk emissible uh, constituents. And our experimental co collaborators in the group of Sylvie Rousset in Paris did the experiment. This is their scanning tunneling microscope image of this surface. And indeed, they form the surface alloy. So every dark spot here is an iron atom, and these light spots are gold atoms. Now, not only can we predict that you can make this material, but we can also theoretically understand why this material forms. So if you remember, uh, I told you one of the advantages of doing a calculation is you can turn certain effects off. So one of the effects we could turn off in our calculation is we could turn off the magnetism, turn off the spin polarization. And lo and behold, if we do that, then we found this material does not want to form. So it is magnetism which stabilizes the formation of this material. When an iron atom is surrounded by six gold atoms, then due to the lowering of hybridization with its neighbors, it has a very high magnetic moment. And this lowers the exchange energy and stabilizes the formation of this material. So now I will come to a third example where I want to talk about the diffusion and sintering of ultra small supported metal clusters. So I have been talking to you about uh, metal nanoparticles and supporting them on oxide supports and all that. But what happens if you actually put a metal nanoparticle on an oxide? So this is an electron micrograph of it. So see what is happening here. You, if you look carefully, these nanoparticles are moving, already two moved here and diffused together and sintered. That is, they coalesce to form a larger nanoparticle. Now, again, if you watch this video for long enough, this nanoparticle and this nanoparticle will diffuse together and then they will coalesce to form a yet larger nanoparticle. This is because uh, a nanoparticle can always lower its energy by fusing with another nanoparticle to form a still larger nanoparticle. See, that happened again. So this sintering is something that is unfavorable, okay? It is one of the biggest uh, reasons why nanocatalysts get degraded, for example. And so you have to try to prevent this reaction. You want to understand how does this reaction happen? Does it happen by lots of nanoparticles moving and fusing? Or does it happen by what's called Oswald ripening or by monomer addition, etc.? Are some metals less likely to sinter than the others? We want to get an understanding of all this. So we are going to study first ultra small clusters of nanoparticles. Why do we study ultra small clusters? Not just because it's computationally easy, but actually one of the hottest areas in the field right now is what are called single atom catalysts, where the active catalyst is just one atom of a metal on a metal, on an oxide support. Okay. So we are studying first how if, for example, here I've studied a single platinum atom. This calculations were again done by my student Nisha Maman. We are studying how one platinum atom moves on a magnesium oxide surface. Okay. And so this is not just some cartoon animation here. This is actual calculations of the energetics using a method called the nudged elastic band. 
and we can calculate the energy barrier for this diffusion process to happen. And we see that for as the bonds are broken, as the particle moves along the surface, it takes a, the particle has to overcome a barrier of 0.88 EV to move along the surface. And the process by which it moves is what is called hopping, which is it's just a simple translational motion. Obviously, you can have only this kind of motion if you have a single atom. The surprise comes when you look at slightly bigger particles. So if you have two platinum atoms, that is a platinum dimer, then it does, it's not a single translation. If you look at this picture, it does a, what is called a cartwheeling motion. Okay, so it is clearly standing upright, then flat, then upright, then flat, etc. And it has this funny little uh, energy landscape. And the barrier is much lower now. It's just 0.42 electron volts. Okay. Now, if I look at a trimer that is three platinum atoms, it's yet another mechanism. It's this sort of ponderous moving along the surface. And when I looked at this uh, uh, animation, I thought, I this reminds me of something. And then it struck me what it reminded me of is what's shown here, which is for those of you who've seen the Star Wars movies, these are what are called the at-at walkers. These are these uh, troop transport things which the empire has, which move along slowly in this sort of manner. So the trimer diffuses by at-at walking. Okay. Uh, sorry, I sh should have shown you. I forgot. I, I meant to show you another animation. I put the same slide twice by mistake. If I have the tetramer, which is four atoms, it diffuses by a fourth mechanism, which is a rolling mechanism. Now, okay, I have got all the barriers. What else do I understand from this? One very surprising thing we found is that if I compare across elements, Okay, then if I look, uh, for example, at silver, gold, palladium, and platinum, I find that the diffusion barriers for the monomers, the dimers, and the tetramers seem to scale with the melting temperature of the bulk. So this is the diffusion barrier for trimers on MGO. And this is the bulk melting temperature of silver, gold, palladium, platinum. And look at this scaling relation and people were initially saying no 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 this is crazy this is just some coincidence and referees were yelling and shouting at us etc because it seems so non intuitive that you know three atoms on mgo should scale their diffusion barriers with the bulk melting temperature but we actually showed where this relation comes from we also showed why it doesn't hold for the dimer Okay, so this is very useful because it tells you how likely something is to sinter. It tells you that it depends on the bulk melting temperature of that metal. Uh, we also understand from these calculations, we can extract the mechanisms of sintering. Okay, so for example, here I've compared for platinum and gold that I start with four single atoms of platinum or four single atoms of gold. And by from all my calculations of diffusion barriers and things, I can see what is the energetically most favorable process by which sintering occurs. And for platinum, I see that it happens by one atom at a time being added, but in a very non-intuitive way which is that the bigger particle diffuses and joins a monomer. So two atoms join and move, diffuse, and uh, uh, join a monomer to form a trimer. Then the trimer diffuses and joins a single atom to form the tetramer, et cetera. Whereas for gold, the process is the opposite process of what is called particle migration and coalescence. So these are all insights which help us understand sintering. Uh, the last uh, thing I'm going to talk about, I just have a couple of slides, I'm pretty much out of time. Uh, we are interested in looking at a molecule called COPC, this is short for cobalt thalocyanine, 
uh, it is a neutral molecule usually, but if you can make it negatively charged, then it is known to be a good catalyst uh, for CO2 reduction. And how do you make it negatively charged? Uh, so uh, our, together with our experimental collaborators with the group of Jerome Lagout in Paris, uh, we showed that if you put it on graphene that has been doped with nitrogen atoms, then not uh, when the COPC is on plain graphene, it is still neutral. If it is on a single nitrogen dopant, it is still neutral. But if it is on a pair of nitrogen dopants, then it becomes, it acquires a full electron. Uh, this is from their STS data where they can uh, deduce how charged it is. And this is from our DFT calculations. These are again, electron transfer plots like uh, the ones I showed you before where the red lobes show electron gain and the blue lobes show electron loss. These calculations were done by my student Saurav Mondal. And you see that over here, this is on undoped graphene. This is on graphene uh, where there are two nitrogen atoms here. And you see that there's significant charge transfer here. And that is why it becomes negatively charged and uh, it changes its oxidation state and then becomes a good catalyst. This work was published uh, very recently in Nano Letters. Okay, so I'm done. So the take home message I've given, I want to leave you with is just something very simple, which is that density functional theory when used in tandem with experiments can be used very successfully to understand why materials possess the properties they do and to design novel nanomaterials with desired properties. And uh, thank you very much. And uh, Bulumoni, you will see, I think, I hope I've done it properly for your sake. I think I put it in Assamese also to thank you. Thank you very much. It was really nice, Shona. Okay. Yeah. So, Vandana, can we take questions now? Sure. So, uh, firstly, okay, my personal comment, very, very nice talk, Shobhana, and I have, uh, there are uh, uh, more than 40 people watching on YouTube, and uh, uh, the, I will first read out a comment from YouTube by MS Narayanan, wonderful way of presentation. A lot of cartoons to make a point, even person with no background could understand some basics. I think it really sums up what uh, uh, the lecture is. So very nice and thank you for that. Uh, there are a few questions. So we'll first take questions from YouTube. Uh, Abhinav Choudhury asks, what is quantum confinement effect in nanomaterials? Okay, so the quantum, con well, I, I don't know in what detail to go, but uh, if the person, I don't know if the person has some uh, basics of physics or what, but uh, partly if you, if you study the particle in a box in quantum mechanics, it is that if electrons are confined in a box, then the energy levels get quantized and the smaller the box, the more uh, widely separated the levels. So this is, for example, a way of tuning the band gap of, say, a semiconductor quantum dot or something like that, it's where if you uh, confine the electrons within a particle of small size, then because the allowed energy levels of electrons get spaced wider and wider apart, this uh, controls things like the optical properties of the particle. Yeah, uh, very nice. Uh, the another question is uh, by uh, uh, Abhinav Chudri is what are the future possibilities of graphene based nanomaterials and their usage as detectors for improving the electron neutrino mass measurement? Okay, I, I don't know about the electron neutrino mass measurement. Maybe you can answer that better than I can. Uh, since that is something a particle physicist would have to uh, answer, but certainly 
graphene electronics is a very exciting field. Uh, I don't think it yet has commercial, uh, uh, I don't think commercial devices are yet in the market, but certainly graphene, uh, I just mentioned graphene very briefly in my last slide, but graphene is certainly the wonder material. It was a two dimensional uh, monolayer of carbon atoms, which started this whole explosion of work in two dimensional materials and graphene has very, very exotic and superior properties. And it is uh, uh, one of the challenges of using it for electronics is that it doesn't have a band gap. So you have to induce a band gap. And it is certainly, uh, so I think perhaps we would have more uh, interest in making devices out of things like phosphorine or molybdenum diselenide, disulfide, etc., which have band gaps. But graphene is certainly the uh, mother or the father of this whole family of materials, and it's a very exciting field. Yeah, so just uh, to add that, I mean, you have already covered all the properties of graphene, but as you very correctly said, the graphene as detectors is in a very early stage. And there is also these all these materials, other materials also you mentioned will have uh, applications even in medical imaging because they will be a cheap and large size detectors. So that's also there apart from detectors. Okay. Uh, so we move on. Uh, Basavraj Kagali is asking, is it possible to work out the composition and structure of a room temperature superconductor using nanoparticles? I don't think so. I mean, I don't know how you would use nanoparticles to... Uh, my immediate answer would be no. I think to work out the structure, you would use X-ray diffraction. And to uh, work out the composition, you would use some kind of spectroscopic technique. So I don't think you would use nanoparticles for this purpose. OK, thanks. Um, Uttam Pal has two questions. Could DFT many body theory predict nanoparticle? OK, I don't know what that means by predicting a nanoparticle and dft many body theory also i don't know what that means because usually you do either dft or many body theory though there are certain techniques uh, that people use like dmft which which, is, which are sort of combinations of many body theory and dft uh, predict nanoparticle means you can use it to predict the structure of a nanoparticle and you can use it to predict the properties that nanoparticle would have. So in that sense, yes. Okay, he has another question which again says, could DFT many body theory predict nanoparticle monopole? Uh, so I don't think it has been done. Uh, if you had something like a monopole, it would be some very exotic thing, which I don't think would uh, probably, it would be some very strongly correlated effect, which probably wouldn't come from DFT. Uh, I think I should explain there what I mean. I told you that we have some very good guesses for the exchange correlation functional. And I would guess that if you had some strange system which had a monopole in it, uh, you would need to use many body theory and not DFT because our existing exchange correlation functionals would not be able to reproduce this effect. But this is just a guess. Okay, so that's all I can say. Okay, um, there are quite a few more questions. <laughs> uh, it's really, really uh, inter people have interest here. Yeah. So Ravindra Kumar Sinha has asked, can we explain optical properties like negative refraction using DFT? Yes, sir, you can. Uh, to do optical properties, you have to uh, look at uh, excited states and you have to go beyond what, the very simple kind of DFT that I talked about, which looks at only the ground state properties, but there are extensions 
to DFT and you do things like what is called the GW method, etc. And then you can look at optical properties. Again, there is a question from Ravi Chinnapan. Different exchange correlation functional would give different energetics for the nanoparticles? Uh, sometimes, yes. So for the band gap, for example, the band gap is something that it is, well, it depends what you mean by energetics. Uh, typically, the structure is given reasonably well by most exchange correlation functionals. So there may be slight differences, but something like the band gap, you would certainly get differently with different exchange correlation functionals and the uh, simplest ones will get it wrong. Okay, there's uh, one more uh, question uh, by Uttam Paul. Do all bulk physical properties get inverted at nanoscale? No, of course not. Okay, there is an appreciation by Rachna Singh very nicely explained and a comment by Vikrant Chaudhary. The chemistry story is really nice and I can <laughs> connect with her on that. Uh, also a comment by Gautam Ghosh, reduced graphene oxide has band gap so it can be used instead of phosphorine. Yeah. Okay. So I think that's all from the YouTube right now and we now go back to Zoom and see if there are any questions there. So over to you Bulmoni. Uh, thank you, Vandana. Actually, I can't see any question here in the Zoom platform. So no, I would like to raise their hands if they have questions. Yeah. So, yeah, I would like to ask one thing to Shobhna. Sure. Yeah, uh, actually, I have gone through the paper uh, in Zex uh, with Nisha. Mm -hmm. So uh, I have read it. You have talked about the uh, doping of uh, MZO with aluminum, right? Yeah. So my query was that uh, I have seen that you have done it at different concentrations. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, did you check uh, uh, the positions of uh, aluminium means uh, apart from this concentration, say uh, I am going to put say uh, two aluminium atoms uh, maybe in the uh, unit cell of three cross three or something like that. So accordingly, we calculate the concentration. But uh, my query was that can we put the uh, two aluminium atoms uh, close to each other, something like that. Uh, can we check? That? Yeah, yeah. So we have looked at that, and in fact, some that's something we are continuing to look mm -hmm. at. So initially, we looked at what was the lowest energy configuration, but what we're beginning to realize is that sometimes it is interesting to look at something that may not also be the lowest energy configuration. Mm -hmm. So, for example, for this nitrogen doped graphene problem that I looked at. I mean, it may be energetically favorable for the nitrogens to be far apart, but uh, you do occasionally have these pairs of nitrogens together, and that is what you really want. Mm -hmm. And so we are actually now looking at cases where the two dopants are, too cl are close together. Mm -hmm. And we also looked at, uh, you know, which layer the dopant is in and things like that. So yeah. that doesn't matter so much, it turns out. Okay, so it was random, right? What? Uh, the position of the... Uh, no, we put them uniformly dispersed. Okay, okay, okay. In regular patterns. Yeah. Okay, okay. So actually, I am interested in doing MZO monolayers. So I am going through the literature. So let's so work together, Bhuliman. <laughs> 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 yeah, sure. I know, but okay. we should talk anyway. Yeah. I have one question. Yes. Yeah, so more general. I think uh, since they are, uh, we are also lo uh, looking at the younger audience in this uh, uh, lecture, maybe something uh, what you would like to say for people who are looking for research opportunities in this area. Okay, so uh, I would say that, okay, I think this is a good area to get involved in because you do not need much infrastructure to work in this area. In fact, I am very involved in activities to teach density functional theory to researchers in Africa and students in Africa. Uh, 
as you know, of course, India is a developing country. We lack uh, resources, but uh, in many parts of Africa, the situation is even more difficult for those who want to do research in science. And, you know, something like density functional theory, you don't really need expensive infrastructure to do it. And as I said, uh, there are problems you can even do with a laptop. So I think it is a good thing to do. There are also lots of free codes available. So you can download these codes freely and start working. However, the one caution I want to tell people is that just because it's freely available code and you can download it and you can use it doesn't mean that you will do things correctly or you will do good science. You need to learn a little bit how to do it and how how to use these things correctly. I mean, there are also a lot of people who are downloading these codes and using them wrongly and sort of producing very incorrect results. And so what I would urge you to do is there are lots of videos online which teach you how to do these things. There are also lots of workshops held occasionally where people teach you how to do this. So try to join something like that or try to find someone who can teach you how to do it properly. And then I think it would be a very exciting area to go into. The other thing I want to tell you is even if you want to go beyond using a laptop, I'm not saying you just have to use a laptop. There's something now called the National Supercomputing Mission, which ha is setting up a network of very high performance uh, computing resources across the country. And if you have a good idea, you can apply to these centers and you can get a grant of computer time. You can also get grant for, you know, uh, human resources, etc. And uh, if you have a good solid idea, you will get computer resources at one of these places. Thank you very much. Shubhna. It was a very nice, uh, very uh, illuminating answer for the youngsters. There's one question from YouTube. The last question I can say, can we use DFT to reduce the band gap in phosphorine and graphene? Uh, yes, of course you can. I mean, the question is, how will you do it? So you can try various things. You can create defects in phosphorine. In, in graphene, I mean, there is already a zero band gap. But in phosphorine, you can try to play with the structure. You can try to introduce dopants, etc. So you can do all this, and then you can study the effects with DFT, certainly. Yeah. Thank you. Over to you, Bulumani. So I, I can't see any question here uh, in the Zoom. And I think there were a lot of queries uh, in YouTube. So young people are mostly uh, actually participating through YouTube. So it was really a nice uh, talk and we could learn many things, although I am from the same field. But uh, the presentation was really nice as expected because I have heard Sovna many times. As I said, it, uh, she is an excellent presenter uh, and a good teacher. So from my side, actually, Vandana, I think uh, okay. the presentation is over. And uh, if people are interested, they can communicate with Shovna. She responds quickly. Thank you so much, uh, Shovna. Really, really very wonderful talk. And I uh, also thank Bulumoni for conducting uh, this lecture. Uh, and I, I, thank the, I thank the IPA for asking me to give this. Our pleasure. Thank you. And uh, thank you all for joining us into this lecture. The lecture next week uh, will be given on Saturday. The time is slightly changed because we have a speaker from US. The lecture will be given at 6 p.m. by Professor Subir Sachdev and he, talk, he will talk about a simple model of many particle quantum entanglement, how it describes black holes and superconductors. So I uh, request all of you to join us next Saturday at 6 p.m. Stay safe, take care. Thank you all. Bye-bye.